This interview is a part of the Oklahoma Historical Society's Oral History Program Living Legends Collection. This interview was originally conducted on June the 2nd, 1973. The interview was conducted by Mr. Frank Benedy. The interviewee is Mr. Dick Rice of Watonga, Oklahoma. This interview is being recorded, re-recorded on the 17th of September, 1984 for inclusion in the permanent collections of the oral history program by Judith Michener. This is Frank Benedy, Hitchcock, Oklahoma, Blaine County. This is May or June the 2nd, 1973. Recording for Living Legends, Dick Rice of Watonga. And he lived west of Watonga. Where were you born, Dick? At Augusta, Kansas. Where were you born, Dick? I was born at Augusta, Kansas, at eight Augusta. miles east of Augusta, Kansas. On a farm. On a farm. A little Walnut River. On the Walnut River. Now, which part of Kansas is that in? Well, that's kind of the central east. It's about 25 miles, about 35 miles east of Wichita. And uh, how long had your father lived in Kansas? Well, he was born there. In what crops did you raise there in Kansas? Well, it was mostly corn and oats right in the area we was, alfalfa. And your mother, where did she? She was born right at the same place in about three or four miles of each other. There's a little store they called Bodock. Her dad ran a, a mill there, water mill there. The ground grain? Yeah, ground all, made flour, made lots of flour. Did you remember that mill? Oh, yes, yeah, I can remember. <laughs> uh, after the mill kind of quit, my granddad had a lot of this silk that he'd come in big bowls that they run the flour through to make it fine and all. So he gave it to my mother, and she made my sister some silk dresses out of it. Now, uh, when did you come to Oklahoma? 1908, in November 1908. And let's see, how old would you have been then? I was six years old the first night we camped out in Oklahoma. We come here in a covered wagon, and, and we stayed up by north of Ponca City, just over the line into Oklahoma. You went that far in one day? Yeah, we went from uh, where we lived, over by Augusta, we come to no, we didn't go that far the first day. We stayed right north of Winfield at a little place they call Rock the first day. And then we come from right north of Winfield to just over into Oklahoma the next day. And you were in one covered wagon? No, I had an uncle that we was traveling with. That we Each, my dad and him, had a covered wagon, two covered wagons. And uh, did you bring any cattle or? Well, we, they shipped a car down to Fay, Oklahoma, and they had some cattle and horses and stuff in it, but uh, all we had was some horses. We had some extra horses leading them. And uh, what time of the year was this? Maybe you that, told me, but I might not have caught it. Well, that, <clears throat> that was in November. We got here the, to where we lived, where we lived afterwards where my dad had bought a place. We got there before, the day before Thanksgiving. Was the weather cold? No, it was real nice weather And when we got here. The next night, on Thanksgiving night, we got a big rain, I remember that. Terrible, real warm like rain. Did your dad come down sometime in the summer to look at the farm? Yeah, he come down here in 1907 and bought it, and then he rented it out that year, and then we come in the fall. What made him decide to come to Oklahoma? Well, my mother's brothers was down here, Bradford's, and uh, they was already down here, and 
in 1907 when he come down here they had one of the biggest corn crops anybody ever saw and they, it had been wet and all and they hadn't even hardly farmed it and his, he thought they really come to the land of paradise. <laughs> yeah, we've all seen a few of those kind of years. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, <laughs> Not enough of them. Yeah. Well. <laughs> uh, well, how did your mother like this country? Well, when we, when we first got here, we liked it fine, but then uh, went on to, I remember I grew up pretty good side in 1911. Everything burned up and real bad, and she used to, I, I can remember her crying to go back to Kansas. That's where her folks lived then. Well, they were still living. And she didn't like it very well. Did they ever come to, her folks ever come to Oklahoma? Yeah, they finally moved down here uh, later on, and... They both, both their folks, they was Bradford's. They passed away here. Now, uh, you were six years old. Had you started the school in Kansas? Yeah, I'd started when the term started uh, in Kansas and went a little bit in Kansas, see, before we left. And then that was my first year of school. How far did you have to go to school there? In Kansas? Yeah. Oh, about three quarters of a mile. <clears throat> and what kind of a schoolhouse was that? Well, it's just a little old frame schoolhouse, and uh, we had some neighbor kids that always drove. They had an old spring wagon, and they'd come right by our place, and I had two sisters older than me, and, and we'd ride with them every day to this school. Could you kind of tell me what the country looked like to you up there when you were a kid? Well, right in the area we was was commenced to get far enough east that we was kind of getting in the edge of the Flint Hills. There's quite a lot of grass, and uh, the river bottoms, that's where they raised their good crops and stuff, but uh, the ground where we lived, the higher up ground, they didn't do a lot of farming on it. Your dad, uh, he raised mostly uh, cattle? Mostly cattle in where we was in Kansas. What did the cattle look like in those days? Well, near, uh, I remember the home cattle, native cattle, was real nice cattle, but they used to ship them in from Texas. That was their main deal, was ship them in them big pastures there from Texas. They had terrible long horns, and when they got there, they looked kind of like razorback hogs. <laughs> did you remember any of the cowboys? Well, I remember... I can remember some of them, but not too good. How did they dress in those days? Well, Quite a bit different from the farmers around there. No, they they dance. They dress a whole lot like them. Only they they all wore a big hat and and had their boots. And outside of that, the, most of them just wore overhauls. They didn't wear Levi's in like they did later on, near as I remember. When, uh, how long did they keep those cattle on the grass before they shipped them? Well, they'd usually, <clears throat> they'd come in there in the spring and, and unload them. The railroads would go right through these big pastures and they'd have unloading places. They'd just unload right in them big pastures and they'd keep until about October and go on to Kansas City or St. Louis with them, somewhere. I don't know just where. They'd just keep them one year usually. They was all big stuff when they come in. Where did these people stay that shipped their cattle in there? Did they have houses or? Well, they'd, they, they'd have a ranch house somewhere on, on this ranch for, their, for them and their help too. They usually had pretty good sized houses, the rancher would. I, they, did I ask you what color mainly the cattle they shipped in were? No. But I remember they was uh, kind of all different kinds of colors. They'd be black and red and uh, not many you'd see with white faces, but they'd be of a red and black and, uh, and a lot of buckskin colors and something like the Charlet of today, only they'd be kind of a buckskin color. About how much would these cattle weigh when they'd come in there, would you say? Oh, I don't know. Uh, they they were terrible big frame, but but I'd say probably they wouldn't weigh over 900 or 1,000 pounds. 
uh, they all be awful poor. I seen lots of them down, and they drag them out there in the grass, and they'd eat around, and they'd drag a throw a rope on them, drag them a little far, and in a few days they'd get up and go. <laughs> Did they gain much weight up there? Oh, they gained awful fast. Yeah. They put on lots of weight. Now, when you came here to Oklahoma, you came southwest of Watonga first? Yeah, that's where we first come. That's where we come and, and stayed until I moved back to town. See, back. That would be probably uh, 15 miles southwest? No, it was 11 miles. 11 miles? 11 miles southwest. And where did you go to school out there? Well, I went to a little old school they call Mount Pleasant. And what type of schoolhouse was it? What, how was the building? Well, when, when we first come here, it, it was uh, the old building had old dimension sawed lumber that they sawed out of the canyon, but it had shingle roof and pretty good siding, but the floors was made out of oak and they wasn't even nailed down. I remember some of the bigger boys used to chew the back and they'd raise, right in time of school and they'd raise up a board and spit down through there and lay the board back down. <laughs> Do you remember who your teacher was? Well, I don't know as I remember the first teacher, for, but the second year I remember a fellow by the name of Robert Hurt was the second year teacher. I, I don't remember the, the first teacher's name. I don't believe now. Uh, how many, did you go to any other country schools besides that one? Yeah, I went to school at this school three years, and then we moved off this place that my dad owned. We got a chance to get some more land and better land on to the southwest. That's about 17 miles from Watonga, and it's in a, they call it Garden Valley country. And we lived down there, I went to school five years down there, and that's the last of my school. And what kind of a building was it? Well, it had, uh, it was made uh, out of good lumber. It was a better building, than, but it's a, still the same one-room school. About how many children went to that school? Well, that school wasn't so crowded down there. They was about 40 went down there. Up this other school, the second year I went to school, they 66 of us. We sat three in a seat. And then they had long benches in there in the back for the bigger ones that they just set them plumb full, kids. What would you do on Sundays and weekends? Well, they, at Sunday, they always had preaching or something at this school. First one preacher and then another didn't come there and preach or we'd always have Sunday school and then all through the winter, uh, every Friday night, we'd have what they call literary. That kind of program, you know, and they'd have a big time. That, that's about all it was. Rest you don't suppose you went to that mostly just to meet girls, do you? <laughs> well, I, I guess after you got a little bigger, that was part of the deal. <laughs> Uh, let's see. One thing I've been wanting to ask you, what did those canyons look like in those days? How were the trees? Well, the trees at that time was tremendous big. Big cedars and, and big, uh, used to be a bur oak growed in them. But they was all cut out for post. Uh, you see, at that time, they, them big cedars, they'd split them out and haul them to El Reno and all around. That's one way they made a living through the winter. And uh, and they just, they had tremendous big trees in them. Did they have any sawmills? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they'd be a sawmill ever old 10 or 15 miles around somewhere in them big canyon. They'd be a sawmill. Was there much wild game? Well, uh, there was a tremendous lot of quails at that time, but uh, very few. There was a few turkeys left when we come here and a few deer, but it wasn't long until they was all gone. Did you ever hear of bears being in this country? No. Well, you'd hear the story of it, but I know we had a neighbor that uh, killed a mountain lion in what they call Trench Canyon. It, it was 
between us and Watonga. It's out here about seven miles. Uh, he killed a mountain lion. I, I saw the mountain lion. He skinned it and made a rug out of it. About how big was a mountain lion? Was it bigger than a bobcat? Oh, yes. It, it's considerable bigger than a, than a bobcat. It, it was as big as a average collie dog. Not a big dog, but average collie dog. It was a slim bodied. And what, what about uh, bobcats? Were there many bobcats? Oh, yes, there's lots of bobcats when they come here, but then they disappeared after the country started to settle them up a little more. And they didn't come back no more till here six or seven years ago. They've got pretty thick again here, but it's hard to ever see a bobcat through the early teen or the late teens and early twenties. What about prairie chickens? Were there any prairie chickens? Yeah, there's quite a lot of prairie chick chickens. Have you ever eaten prairie chickens? Yeah, yeah. I don't care much about them. They've got terrible black meat and then their legs was all full of little fish bones because you couldn't eat them. <laughs> they said prairie chickens were pretty easy to kill, is that? Oh yeah, they they just about as dumb as house chickens. There'd be any grain around or something, they'd come in early in the morning to eat, you'd kill them things. They they soon got rid of them too. Now what about in the opens between the canyons? Were the were were there trees between the canyons? Well, you know, they used to be big forests and they kept it all burnt out. It kinda looked like a prairie land, all of it did. That's one thing fooled my dad. He thought he was getting a prairie place more or less. And uh, after he started pasturing it, putting cattle and stuff on it, by this, trees commenced to grow, and in eight or ten years, it it all turned to brush. But when we first come here, it all looked like prairie land almost. What about water? Did you have much trouble getting water? No. Out in our area is about 60 foot to water, and you get water anywhere you dug. Plenty, plenty of house and stock water. What about snakes? Oh, the, they was wolves of snakes, uh, whip snakes, and all that kind of snake. Different, there's several different kinds of whip snakes, lots of bull snakes. They they was terrible thick when we come here. <laughs> but uh, they was a little old spotted rattler. They stayed out on on really the prairie land where trees didn't never grow tall, and uh, they kind of stayed around prairie dogs. Dens. They'd be quite a few prairie dog dens. Quite a few of them little spotted rattlers, but they disappeared too as the people moved in a little thicker. Did you ever break any sod? Yeah, heck yeah. What kind of plow did you use in that? Well, it just had kind of a shear on it and an old wooden beam in the thing and it had rods come back on the doggone thing uh, to kind of break this sod up, let it fall through, or break it up. They're, they call them sod plows or rod plows, but but I had done quite a bit of that myself, all of them old plows. How many horses did it take? To well, it, it usually use three on a 12-inch sod plow. That's about as big as you generally see is a 12-inch at that time. And you broke that, where you were breaking sod was out southwest of here. Yeah, yeah. And how much of the land did you, would you say was broken at the time that you moved out there? Oh, I don't know. I don't think there's over a third of the land broke. But maybe not that much when we come to this country. Did they have much trouble with it blowing in early days? Well, not not so much. Uh, it had all of this humus in it, you know, and hadn't all got out of there. But after they went to farm, it pretty good, and they got to farming cotton and one thing and another. It it got to where is that sandier ground got to blowing pretty good, you know. But that same way with washing, wasn't it? Yeah, didn't wash for no, several years. Several years it didn't wash. It it done more of its washing several years later than that. Now, uh, let's see, when did I start to ask? Oh, yes, what did you plant the first year after you break the sod? Well, I usually plant uh, Capricorn or something like that the first year. It seemed to stand the droughts and do better. 
some would plant cotton, but uh, that sod wouldn't work back together very good, and it wouldn't hold moisture enough. But Capricorn seemed to do pretty fair on it. And what town did you go to the most? Well, we we mostly went to Fay, a little town of Fay. At that time, we used to come to Watonga some, but we'd done all of our trading and all at this little town of Fay. We just five miles from it. What about the country stores? Quite a few country stores. Oh yeah, these country stores ever a few miles around, and when we first come here, usually they had a post office at some of them stores. Instead of a mail route, they had a, a guy bring this mail out to this store, and then you'd go to the store and get your mail. But I don't think that lasted only about one year after we come here. That's what I, I never did think to ask anybody, but that's what I always wondered, how they got their mail, these yeah. little stores. There was many of them. Uh, there'd be a guy come out through, and he'd... From the railroad. Yeah, from the railroad from this uh, in our area from Fay and he'd deliver to these little stores and then he'd go back and then you'd come get your mail might be a week later when you went to get it but what did it cost to send a letter in those days do you remember well I kind of seemed me like a cent and a half but maybe it was two I don't remember but uh, it seemed like it was a cent and a half, as near as I remember, back when I was just a kid. Were there very many Indians out in your country? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this place that we moved to down in the Garden Valley, we was just three miles from Old Whirlwind. And there was a big government school there. They, they had a wonderful school and a church and a commissary for the Indians. And I don't know how many kids went to school there at a time, but a lot of, in the winter time, that whole is, is on the South Canadian River. And uh, that whole country down in, down in the valley there would be full of Indian teepees, and all tents. In the spring after school, they'd pull out, and you'd see them a mile, train of them a mile long, one behind the other, and leaving. And they lived in teepees? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was no such thing as a wood house then for an Indian for several years after we come here. Can you remember the names of some of the Indians around you? Oh, yeah, I can remember the names. They was uh, the Rising Elk and Old Chief Whirlwind and Old Dave Pennington and Howard Bird, all oh, that. I I could go on and on. I guess if I just keep thinking, I I, I was kind of friends with the Indians. I, you liked the Indians? Yeah, I liked the Indians, <laughs> real good. My mother, she was scared of them. Many, my mother was scared of them too. See? My mother had long black hair, and them old Indians. They used to tease her about making a good scalp, you know, that long black hair. And, <laughs> and she pretty shook up with the Indians when we first come here. Do you, you ever remember any trouble with Indians? Oh, no, I never heard of no trouble with the Indians till later years. They, they was pretty good Indians then. I don't know, maybe the whites ruined them later on, but but uh, Indians was honest at that time, but they finally got to where they wasn't so trustworthy. Hardly ever Indian ever drank at that time. You'd hardly, they'd get on some peyote parties or something like that certain time in the year, but, but you'd hardly ever hear of an Indian drinking them. The, uh, they lived in these teepees even in the winter. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. They, well, some of them have regular tents, some of them teepees. They did all, all shapes and forms of, uh, I guess, like a person with a house of today, whatever they like the best, you know. How did an uh, Indian camp look in those days? Well, they kept it pretty clean and decent around uh, around the camp, but it'd just be uh, teepees just set real close together, it'd just like looking down on the big town, only it'd be teepees, but they'd be fairly close together. They didn't take up lots of room like 
or building houses or something. Now, uh, what did these Indians eat in the early days? Well, they uh, uh, wrestled a lot. They they hunted rabbits and they hunted quails and and they scavenger around. They they would eat uh, kind of stuff, you know, that died a stock that died. They'd eat eat that stock, you know, if you'd let them have it, and nobody they nobody give it to them, or nobody kept them from it. But then they, uh, the government issued them. When we first come here, the government issued them beef every so often, bought them cattle. And now, uh, how did they keep this meat? Well, in the winter time, of course, they could keep it. But in the summer, they'd cut it real thin. And if they didn't have a a barbed wire fence or something close to them where they could hang this on it, why they hang it on, just pay, uh, fix up little st sticks with cross sticks on it and hang that on there and, and let the sun dry it. And, and it'd keep for months for them after they once got it dried. I don't know the system of it, but they, they their meat never spoiled after they dried it. Now, uh, where, where did you send your... Uh, what did you mostly sell? What crops did you mostly sell in the early days? Well, out in our area, we uh, most of our crops at that particular time was corn and Capricorn and, and cotton. But then in later years, they kind of quit all that stuff and went to wheat, chiefly, as it was as the crop out in there in the last 25 years, I'd say. And about when did they start? Did they thrash this? Uh, Capricorn? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you'd head it and stack it up, you know, and maybe along in the winter after it froze good and dry, they'd come up. It, it was mostly all thrashed in the winter. Be a thrash machine. There wasn't many thrash machines then. You, sometimes it'd be spring when you got thrashed. Who did most of the thrashing out in your country? Well, there were some people by the name of Reinegers that done some thrashing, but the, the main thrashers was John, a fellow by the name of John Mowbray, and and John Barr was the main thrashing guys that would come out through that country. What would your wheat make in there today? Oh, uh, 15 or 20 bushel was pretty good wheat in them days out in, the, in our area. Who had the first tractor that you remember seeing? Well, the first tractors ever anywhere in, in our part of the country, uh, an uncle of mine had is an old Waterloo boy made by John Deere. And that's that's the first tractor I ever really remember out in that area. I'd seen tractors other places in more in the wheat area. That was the year it was it. Well, let's see. I don't know, that seemed like along about eighteen or nineteen, somewhere along there. And how many bottoms would a tractor pull in those days? Well, they they'd pull two twelves or fourteens. Not very good job, but they'd pull them. But they they didn't use them much, really, to farm with like that. They just use them for power. Them older ones, and like on a corn sheller, or a small strike machine, or something like that. Did uh, they start pretty easy? Well, they would at times, and then at times it'd take a fit, and you couldn't figure out what to do. You couldn't get it started. Just hardly say they they wasn't a starting tractor like today. Now, when you had machinery break down, what did you do? Well, they'd be maybe on an old blacksmith shop, be an old country blacksmith shop. Maybe at one of these little country stores or something. They'd take it over there and get it fixed up the best you could. There wasn't no saddling welders or nothing. They done a lot of forge welding, hand welding. That's something you would, a guy today, a lot of people never seen that. They couldn't imagine that you could take two pieces of iron and eat them and weld them together. But You know, I would completely forgot about that till I asked somebody and they'd tell me about this. And then it come back to me that I remembered when I was a kid. I've seen that. Yeah, it is. 
<laughs> Surprising what they could do. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, how did they go about leasing Indian land those days? Well, you sent in bids for it. And to Concho. To the, well, at, when we come here, there was an agency just south of Watonga down here by this south bridge. Uh, Charlie Rickman was the agent. And for this area, you just go there and put in a bid. And, and I think he done the okay in there, but too, at that particular time. And then it was later years, it had moved to Concho. Now, did the Indians farm any in early days? Oh, no. No, no, they didn't farm. Uh -uh. Did any of them ever start farming? Well, along... Uh, I, uh, in the 20s somewhere, the government decided they'd put the Indians to farm and kind of try to make them self-sufficient, and they built them pretty nice homes at that time, little bungalows on their farm, and set them up on farming and stuff and all. But it, they, a lot of them burnt the houses up, lived in the teepee and burnt the houses up for wood and machinery. They soon traded off to the whites for nothing. What about colored people? Were there very many colored people? Oh, yeah. In the area that we went to out there, that's, I'd say half of that country had been homesteaded by colored people, but uh, they was getting rid of it just as fast as they could. That's, uh, any, when the whites commenced come in, they'd buy them out. They, they was ready to get rid of it. They, they didn't make much of success there on their own. How much would they sell these for, or about what? Well, they'd uh, run from around, uh, at that time, some of them poor sandier farms. They'd bring from $1,000, a little better, 2500 You'd buy a pretty, a real good place for 2500 What would the Indian leases sell for? Well, I don't remember them selling many leases till several years later, but uh, they leased... Uh, you could lease a good quarter for seventy-five or a hundred dollars, uh, leasing it. But I don't remember them selling much Indian land until uh, later on in the twenties and along. Then they commenced selling a lot of it. Now, uh, how many of the section lines were open in that country? Oh, there was very few of them. They just wound they just wound around, crossed them big canyons, just across somebody's place. They didn't even follow the section line. They, they wasn't a lot of section lines open. You'd leave Watonga when we first come here, and uh, and you didn't stay in a section line very many places. You just getting out to our country. You wind around, cross the canyon somewhere where you could. And just across somebody's place. They didn't even follow the section line. They, they wasn't a lot of section lines open. You'd leave Watonga when we first come here, and uh, and you didn't stay in a section line very many places. You just getting out to our country. You wind around, cross the canyon somewhere where you could. And... But it's kind of surprising, uh, just from 1908, in the next three or four years, you'd be surprised how they opened up the section lines and put in bridges in them canyons and got more people and they're working their poll tax, you know. Now, uh, were they many, were they much wrestling and lawlessness in them days? Well, no, no, very little that I know of, but I guess before we'd come here, they'd been a band of rustlers in here that caused them quite a problem, the uh, Jaegers and Blacks and some of them. But uh, when we got, at the time we got here, they wasn't much wrestling. I remember one incident where a fella sold a bunch of cattle and they, some fellas come that night and burnt his feet. So he never did tell, but he was living with his daughter. Uh, his wife was dead, and she finally told where the money was because she's afraid they're going to burn his feet off. But uh, that's the only deal of that kind I ever remember. Did they catch him? Did no, they no, they never, they never did catch who done that. Did the man get all right? Yeah, he got all. 
Yeah, but he he had kind of crippled feet after that, but scarred and bad. Was there any murders out in that country? Oh yeah, there was a. This here was later on, about 1916 or somewhere along there. Uh, we had a. Well, I guess you'd call him a neighbor. He lived about three miles from us. It was murdered. That was a kind of a funny deal. He was an old bachelor. They'd knocked him in the head and finally proved to be, knocked him in the head with an ax and they throwed him in the hog pen. He had quite a few hogs, thought the hogs would eat him up, but he had a little old black dog. When they found him, this little black dog, he was in there and he wouldn't let none of the hogs close to him or anything. But he was in terrible bad shape when they found him. They figured two or three days later in this warm weather before anybody discovered him. Did they find who did that? Yeah, they proved that a, a white fella and a colored guy was together that done it, but uh, it was all finally laid on to the colored guy. Urban Kearns was his name. He was sent to Penn for 99 years, but he got out in about 40. He, I seen him after he got back out. Were there any others that you remember? Well, there was an, another murder. I can't think of what their name was uh, that happened off down quite a little ways from us. Uh, and I don't think they ever found out who... Yes, they did find who murdered that old guy because I read not too long ago uh, this this fellow was getting out. He'd been in there about 50 years, and they offered to turn him out, I believe the story was, and and he wouldn't come out. He said he didn't have nowhere to go, and he just stayed down in McAllister. I think there was a little story about that uh, about four or five years ago. It's just a matter. Uh, who did he, uh, you say this man he murdered was a bachelor, too? Yeah. For the money, for money, probably? Well, they figured it was for money. I had an uncle that ran a little store by the name of Amarillo Store, and he bought cream and stuff, and he'd been up there that night. He'd brought up some cream and eggs and stuff, and and I don't know whether he'd uh, really done it just for that money or not, but uh, his money was all gone, anyhow, what he'd give him. And then, I guess it was mostly for cattle. They found 17 head of cattle over here, over at this place. That's, that's they traced the cattle over to this. Kearns is, is the way they found them. 17 head of cattle, I believe it was. Cows and calves or something. What about accidents? Were there many accidents in those days? Oh, well, they, they was quite a few. Uh, accident with horses. Somebody would get a foot caught in a stirrup and dragged to death or get thrown off and killed and runaways. I I know of two or three that got killed in runaways. Miss Fraser got killed in a runaway and and then uh, a fellow by the name of Schrader, he got killed in a runaway. And I had one of my best friend's boy, the boy, uh, he was the, this boy, it was my best, one of my best friends. He, a horse throwed him, broke his neck. What was his name? Neil Talbert. Let's see, where did that happen at? I've heard of that. Well, this here Talbert, he lived uh, out close to us. He he lived in about eight miles of Batonga out here. But but we went to the same school together, and it it happened. He was across in the Trench Canyon when it happened. And uh, he was thrown on the Red Rock. Yep. It was, uh, he couldn't hide across there with nothing but a horse, and he was going over to his uncle's, to George Neal's. And uh, this horse throwed him along one of them Red Rock canyons, and he fell on his forehead and snapped his neck off. Uh, what, uh, this canyon you call Trench Canyon, would you kind of describe that? Well, it. It's a kind of a little short spur of a canyon that comes off to a, off of a big canyon out west of Watonga here. And uh, it's, oh, I'd say it's about 50 foot deep. And it's a real narrow 
thing. Uh, us kids, when we was kids, used to crawl up in it. You had to go down to the end of it and start and crawl up in it. You couldn't get down in it no other way. We used to crawl quite a ways back up in that, that thing. It, it's probably 200, 300 yards long. But it gets an arrow. We never did <laughs> get clear up the thing, but, but you can look down in it from the top, but you can't get down in it without coming down to the end of it and going up, crawling in under, up in it. Does it have a spring? It's in? not a cave. No, it's just a dry land. It's it's not a cave. It's all open. You can look down in it from above everywhere. But. What about thrashing accidents? Were they ever hear of any of those? Oh, some, not too many. That's right. Uh, sometimes somebody, separator man, had something would get an arm or something caught in a belt, tear an arm off or something. I, <clears throat> I knew one guy that got killed. He was on a headed green stack, and he went to slide off of this. He stuck his pitchfork down for kind of to hold as he slid down, and he made a slip, and he slipped straight like a pitchfork handle and killed him. That way. Not too many accidents, that's right, machinery. Uh, machi accidents come to the machinery a little later on when they got getting tractors and powered stuff. What about uh, hay balers and stuff? Were they very dangerous? Oh, yeah. Guys would get a foot or something. They used to feed them with their foot. By, you know, the guy would pitch it up there, and the guy would stand up there with a little old fork, and he'd push it down in here, and, and that hay would get fluffy, and he's supposed to push it down with this fork. They'd have the tines cut off till it was kind of stubby. And uh, he'd get, decide he wasn't getting that hay down, and so they'd call them, they'd feed them with their foot. They'd tramp that hay down in with their foot there, and they'd get kind of careless. That plunger would come back and get a foot sometime. Guys get their foot pretty badly buggered up sometime. Country change, say, like from the Y going west. Well, I remember when we first come here out, out at the Y, that was uh, practically all prey caused by big fires. All you'd see was a big tree now and then. I, I herded cattle in there the come a dry year, and there wasn't many cattle right up in that area. And the, my dad and the a couple of other farmers, they kind of pooled their cattle together, and then they, they paid me so much a day to herd these cattle up there. And, and you could, if it wasn't for a hill or something, you'd see a cow a quarter of a mile anywhere, all in by the Y, driving through there today, you couldn't see a, a goat 15 feet from the road hardly. But that was all the trees you'd see was kind of down in them canyons where the fire couldn't get down in to burn them out. Did uh, you ever see a prairie fire? Oh, man, talk about prairie fires. I remember the first prairie fire I ever seen was when we were coming to Oklahoma, out here northwest of Watonga, where Gorby's lived. They had a rock house there. And we camped down a little bit west of their place, and there's a big fire in the south. And after we camped a while, there's big grass everywhere around. We camped right in the big grass. It, it growed a big blue stem then that would get four or five feet high, and then it had this little blue stem under it. That kind of this big blue stem kind of growed in bunches, and then this little would fill in between. But anyway, to get back to my story, this Mr. Gorby he walked down to our camp that night, and he said uh, to my dad, he said, uh, "You fellas better not camp here tonight." And I remember my dad saying, "Well, why not?" And he said, "Well." See that big fire in the southwest? He's, and the way the wind is blowing, he said, in about two hours' time, by the time you get good to sleep, he said, that's liable to be here. And he said uh, he had a <clears throat> quite a big area burnt off around his house. That's what the first thing they'd do in the fall. Anybody that had any house or anything, they'd all go together and they'd burn them this fire guard all around their buildings on account of these big fires. And uh, he said, you better come up here bring your wagons and come up and camp up here. And so we, they took him at his word and went up there. Well, that far never did get there. The wind went to the northwest later on in the night. I remember we was all in our wagons asleep and along about four o'clock in the morning, I, he woke us up again and 
He said, there's a big storm coming out of the northwest. He said, Do you fellas better get out of these wagons and come in the house. He had a rock house. And spend the rest of the night in the house. So we all get out of the wagon and goes into his house. And there's a terrible windstorm from the northwest, but not much rain. It blowed to come over fast. And, and <laughs> I remember that. That was my first initiation in Oklahoma with big fires and windstorms. I can remember that just as well. Now, uh, when you come on southwest of there, did you find the strip that had been burned off? Well, no, we, you see, the way we come, we was coming to the southwest, coming southwest, and then we come into Watonga, and this fire was a little to the east of Watonga. We missed where the fire had been, but uh, I, I understand that there was some horses or something caught in that fire that night. I, I heard afterwards and was burned in, in a big pasture down there in the edge of the hill down there. How, when you left uh, Gorby's, how did you, how did the trail come into Watonga? Well, uh, that road was about like it was for several years afterwards. We come down, we left this Gorby place and you dropped off kind of down into a little canyon. You come up this little canyon a ways and then wound around through there and then, then you come into a section line. You, they had section lines from that direction. And, the out northeast of Watonga was a lot better settled up than it was southwest of Watonga. Southwest of Watonga was a world of Indian land all back, and then and there hadn't been too much homestead land back in there. And but to the up around Hitchcock and on back through there, that's pretty well settled up country at that time. What kind of houses did they have up in there around Hitchcock? And well, they were some two-story, pretty nice houses. They all had pretty nice houses for for that time of year. You you couldn't tell how the country really, you come to Watonga and when you left Watonga, just like you're driving into another world as far as houses or anything, you'd never see over a two-roomed house hardly after you left Watonga. And half the white people lived in had dugouts or half dugouts. They'd have a dugout and, and board it up above and, and they, out into the area where we come. What time? log houses, the colored, they all had log houses. Of course, as they's are selling out and whites coming in, the whites would usually build them a nice little frame house, maybe two or three rooms. What kind of house did you live in? Well, when we come here, uh, the place my dad bought didn't have no house at all on it. So we had a place rented from an uncle of mine that lived in Kansas, but he'd bought a place here in Oklahoma. He he ran a store in Kansas at this little bulldog. But he bought this farm in Oklahoma, so we moved on it. It had a five-room house. It, it had one of the best houses in the country on it. That's where we lived the first year, and then on my dad's land, we just built a, a two-roomed house. It, it was a, a good built house, but it's just, uh, near as I remember, a 14 by 28 house. Do you remember anything about Anderson Chamberlain? Oh, yeah, I knew Anderson Chamberlain. Uh, he lived just out here across the, the North Canadian River, and, and his boy, Sammy Chamberlain, or, uh, yeah, Sammy Chamberlain, I believe was his name. He was a half Indian boy. His mother was white. I knew him real well. I hired him to break a saddle horse for me. He was quite a cowboy, this young Chamberlain. But I remember Sammy, old man Anderson Chamberlain, too. What did he look like? Oh, he was a tall, slim, he was a typical looking cowboy. He was tall, slim, slender, loin-like fella. He, he, he was what you see in the movies as a real cowboy. Did he wear six years? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he wore six years. But he was... Killed or disappeared in a few years after we come here. Never did know just what exactly happened to him. I never. Maybe somebody knows, but uh, it seems as though I remember that the law was after him or something, and and he disappeared, and they don't know whether the law killed him or left him before they killed him or or, or what. I don't remember just what What happened yeah. to him? He finally died out in Wyoming. Did he? he uh, well, there used to be kind of a weird story about